have uh, a shield. She, she makes it like, like an umbrella. You know? It, it, it can open like an umbrella and she uses it sticky pan on the back of her skirt here so and make out a good skin. You know, so they use a fire after all this lady. And she used to just go and set straight to you and lift the thing. You understand? So you used to open like a skirt. So the, 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 the bullet will be weak and it can drop because it can't move the bullet still. Yeah. Hey guys and welcome to Little Black Book. You know what time it is. Uh, I'll tell you guys about a video. We're going to give you guys a video talking around about the history they didn't tell you. Yes. Uh, if you're new to the channel, do me a favor, do yourself a favor, make sure you like, share, subscribe, click on the bell button for notification of the uploads. For those of you returnees, so let's just paint the picture here. Um, in 1494, Christopher Columbus, who is commissioned by Ferdinand II and Isabella uh, I to go and search out new places on a royal journey. Columbus has obviously been tasked um, uh, well, to find new places that they can actually be economically more beneficial. All right? um, and so Columbus sets off and finds himself trying to find India and actually finds Jamaica and some other Caribbean islands which he names in the West Indies. Um, and so he finds himself on Jamaica um, at 1494 uh, where he discovers the land and then actually encounters a community called the Tainos or the uh, Arawaks, okay? They are Native Americans who've been there since two, been there for about 2,500 years. Some say they've been there since 4,000 BC to 1,000 BC, but they have been there for a very, very long time. And um, they obviously saw the end, uh, you know, the trespassing by Christopher Columbus and actually began to attack Christopher Columbus. Um, and actually managed to ward him off for the time being. Um, and the Arawaks were very fierce and, 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 and dominating and territorial in their possession of their land. Um, hadn't been there for a very long time. Um, and obviously Columbus doesn't give up because he's un obviously he's been sent by the Spanish Inquisition. And then one thing you didn't know about the Spanish obviously at the time, they actually held a lot of the islands there. They hold their Mexico, Panama, um, Honduras, they had um, Jamaica, Cuba, um, uh, you know, and Anguilla. Uh, they held also, you know, um, areas like uh, Guadalupe at the, at the time, anyway. The Spanish held this place there. They even held part of Florida. In fact, Florida, the name of Florida actually comes from the word Flo Florido, which means to have to be flower or flower and wheat. Um, so the Spanish had quite a hold on um, the Caribbean. Um, which makes sense when you watch uh, Paris of the Caribbean. Um, so then Christopher Columbus trails down uh, Jamaica's seal, uh, Caribbean Sea down to what we call Discovery Bay on Jamaica. And this is where he launches his second attack um, at, uh, successfully against the Arawaks. In fact, so successfully, um, they're wiped out. And they're wiped out because he used dogs, horses and guns. And unfortunately, the Arabs couldn't stand against uh, the onslaught that was brought by Christopher Columbus on this particular occasion. Um, but it's said that their lineage and bloodline is very strongly placed in Jamaican uh, people today. And also they have um, strong colonies in uh, the Panama area, uh, sorry, Guyana, uh, Panama and French Guyana East as well. So Christopher Columbus takes over and helps uh, settle the island of Jamaica. And so onwards and outwards, 1494 goes on to 1655. Oliver Cromwell is now the person who's leading a charge uh, for the British colony to come over and take control. And so there's a war between Britain and Spain um, to jostle over the land. And actually uh, what happens is that Britain actually wins this war and then finds himself in the midst of trying to take over the whole land and meeting the Maroon clan. Now, previously before that, the Maroon clan were slaves that were freed. And actually the name Maroon um, sometimes means unruly, um, meaning to be uh, untamed for that uh, as well. All right. Oh, sorry. Maroon clan. And so the, they encountered the Maroon clan, okay? And the Maroon clan are these unruly and fierce fighters that refuse um, to go down. And so they are freed slaves. And actually, this is not only in Jamaica, it's also in Panama, it's also in Mexico, um, it's also in other different parts of, of, the, of the areas where Spanish held power. 
And so the Spanish actually suffered quite a bit trying to get rid of the Maroons before that. They had quite a few fights previously and they now what they call Spanish Town. Um, and actually what you might not have realised also is that with, um, you know, that the Jamaica was called um, Ayamaka, which was the original name by the Arawaks who were originally on the island. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, it dawns on now uh, UK trying to take over the land. And so then we start our story in 1686 of the Queen Nana, uh, or should I say Queen Nana, who is traveling from a shanty town in Ghana uh, on the Atlantic slave trade. And they drop them off in Jamaica. And actually, I remember my father actually even saying to me that uh, the word Jamaica is similar to the Ghanaian word, which means Jama Jamaica, which means we've got stuck here. I guess we've got stuck here, right? Jamaica, I guess we've got stuck here because the inhabitants um, who we call Maroons now um, are, 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 are obviously um, from descendants of the Ghanaians who came over to Jamaica. And so now uh, the British are trying to take over the land of Jamaica completely but are facing resistance from what we call the Windward Maroon Clan. They were led by Queen Nanny. It's said that Queen Nanny was never enslaved, so the myths say. Queen Nanny was never enslaved but she was somebody who was a fierce and militant strategist. It's amazing because when you think about slavery and you think about revolts, you don't think of naturally women who are leading these charges. But the moment I heard Queen Nanny's story, I really did think about the Bible, Deborah in the Bible, and how she led a charge for Israel and defeating her enemy. And so the same thing we see with Queen Nanny here. Queen Nanny comes in um, and lands onto Jam on Jamaica's plane. And actually she becomes a leader from around about 1725 to 1740, okay? Um, and, you know, she's part of the people that are going to put up a resistance against the British Empire. And so, if you don't know, the Caribbean islands are actually split into what we call the Lesser and the Greater Antilles. In the Greater Antilles, we see the countries like Cuba, Jamaica, uh, the Dominican Republic, Pure, Puerto Rico. And then in the Lesser uh, uh, Antilles, you see countries like Anguilla, uh, Guadalupe, um, you know, you see countries like uh, Barbados, Grenada, St. Vincent as well. All right? And they usually form on the lower belt that you normally see on the map. All right? And then you see on the higher belt, or as you say, the northern part of the belt, of Caribbean, you will see the Cuba and the Jamaicans as well that were overtaken by the Spanish. But obviously, the Maroon clans, um, there was more than one um, on the island of Jamaica, and these were just literally free slaves who had run away from uh, their plantation fields to actually uh, be free from the clutches of the colonizer. And so we fast forward again now to around about 1720, 1725, where Queen Nancy, at her maturest age now, finds herself leading the Windward Maroon clan. There were two. There were Windward and then there was Leeward and then there was Leeward um, um, Maroon clans. And these Lee Leeward uh, Maroon clan was on the west side of Jamaica and then the Windward was represented in the east side of that Jamaica. And what we see um, from that particular place is that none of the Maroon clans actually had um, any unity. Well, I mean, obviously there's no Facebook or Twitter or social media to bring them together. And But what um, Queen Nanny seems to do is able to bring the two together. And so there is a united force and there seems to be obviously then a united force of the Maroon clans. Um, although they did work together, they worked also separately as well. And so they have different um, vices and the way they even go about it. The, the Windward, which she was leading, was said to be one of the fiercest and the most aggressive um, clans of the Maroons. And so then we go and we, um, we fast forward it again and we see the first real encounter um, with the uh, British Empire. Queen Nanny is said to be uh, the woman of all. She's the queen of all, the can queen of all, okay? And there are many stories about Queen Nanny as well. One of the stories that was said is, out of, uh, is uh, a great story, which sounds like, it's not Jesus out of the 99, but it sounds like it, um, which is that um, there was a fight that had 99 men taken and killed and one was left to go and send a message back to the British Empire. And what the story was said was that um, uh, Queen Nanny working underneath the powers of the Obia, which would have been a, a juju, or we say black magic kind of um, in, uh, religion, um, of the powers were given onto her, and she actually caught bullets with her bum. This came from Nanny, a famous Maroon leader, used in the battle against the British. 
Come on, Trouble me. The early temple really take the leaf and they close. So when they the soldier them come they party to his bush so they go in trouble. So when they fire fire because you have to fire to play the way. She take her bottom and catch the bullet. And then when she catch the bullet, she oh, them kill her the, the, the black one them come and kill her. Yes, I know it sounds mad, but when you work with Juju, you don't play with that thing. Um, so um, that was one of the stories that was said that she caught bullets with her bum and that allowed obviously then the the the, the Maroon clan also then to attack uh, the British Empire. The second story that's told is quite similar still is that she had um, a, a goat skin hide um, that she had made and put over her back air rear end and what she would do was then she would bend over, lift the flap and it would stop the bullets from entering. Now, um, in those days, the lead bullets, um, I don't know how strong they were, but I believe they couldn't go through goats high. Either way, we know that she done something that was of a mystique and mysterious level that helped the Maroon clan be able to overcome. In fact, she's said to be a queen militant gorilla specialist. And if you that knows about this, she is a person who uses warfare tactics that were beyond anybody's uh, imagination at the time. And so one of the ones that, that is said about her also is a camouflage technique. She began to weave leaves um, as in, in as body armor, or should say as clothing for the Maroon clan so that it would wait in ambush for the British colonel. And actually this was part of the first war which um, the Maroon clan engaged in. And so um, they killed many British um, colonizers who thought they could take over the land and actually kill the Maroon Khan. And actually one of the fights that was happening is that the Maroon Khan were highly, were highly skilled in warfare, but they actually used their terrain to their advantage. So they would stay in the mountain at tops. In fact, they called it Blue Mountain. And not only that, they had some certain towns that they took over, Akon Pong, um, Moor, um, Scott Hall, um, Trade, uh, Tr Trelawney, um as well. And there's another one as well within there as well, which is um, another another town they had, I think, they had as well. I think it was something like Scott, something Castle or something like that, or whatever. Um, but they had control of different islands. In fact, one of the um, cities, is, or should we say towns, is called Nani Town. And there's also a town called Kujo Town, which we'll talk about another time. Trust me, these things are wild, baby. Um, so Queen Nani is um, now leading the charge on his first wall. And they seem to be undefeatable. In fact, they were undefeatable. To the point where down the uh, British um, um, colonizers had to actually concede defeat. Why? Because they were setting up traps for them when they were climbing the mountain to chase them. I mean, it was a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful um, example of the fact that we will not surrender and we will not give in. And what's so beautiful about the fact is that a, a woman leads us. And I always say this as well, warfare, in times of war, we don't care who leads us, just lead. And that's what great leadership does. At the time when the ship is sinking, who will take control and who will show their leadership skills? Um, so the, the war that they faced wasn't a one day affair. The war went on for, uh, for, for decades on decades. Um, around about 60 to 80 years it went on for the correct. Um, and so the war was a bloody one, okay? And But what we saw was that the Maroon clan were able to hold their own and actually force the British to actually enter into a treaty. And this is where it gets a little bit sticky. Um, the windward uh, maroon clan that were led by um, that were led by yours truly queen nanny um, they actually gave into the treaty at 1740 the leeward uh, maroon clan that was led by kujo actually gave into a treaty in 1739 which has led to the end of the first war that was on the island um, the treaty was put into place and actually the treaty what was said was um, that um, they cannot harbor any runaway slaves um, and they must help catch runaway slaves. Now I know this sounds really mad, um, but this is something that we must celebrate. I mean, I know that at the end they had to do a treaty which may not have necessarily been beneficial for slaves, but they showed resilience and toughness to the point where the British colony, who were actually outnumbering the Maroon clan, who actually had more firepower than the Maroon clan, um, that should have won on paper, couldn't do it. Because the skill and the militants and the guerrilla warfare by Queen Nanny overpowered the strategy of the British colony. And this should give us inspiration that as black folk, we didn't just lie there and take it. We didn't just sit there and let them enslave us. We fought back. And so it is inspiring to see so. There was a second Maroon War. Um, 
because the treaty was broken when um, when there was two slaves or two of the Maroon clan that were taken and, and beaten uh, by the British colony. And when they were beating uh, the uh, Maroon clan, with a few of their members went down to the British colony to, to protest and actually were taken on as prisoners. That then led obviously to a second war which was even more um, engaging if you want to talk about from a historical point of view but it was actually another war that was quite bloody again um, and, and again the, the, the Maroon clan did not falter, they did not fold and they did not give in and actually they actually again forced the British into a second treaty and so that second treaty that was given um, the Maroon clan was suspicious of the treaty bear in mind the fact that um, they actually the reason why they were complaining also was the fact that the land that they had at the time for the first treaty um, was actually restricted it wasn't allowing them to expand anywhere and actually have become infertile um, and so they were worried of the second treaty that would put them in a predicament where they wouldn't be able to be free and be at their liberty um, and so but eventually they signed the second treaty uh, and actually the British went back on that second treaty and um, you know, um, sent the slaves away to West Scotia, which is actually in um, uh, uh, Canada, Canada, sorry. And then they also then got sent away to Sierra Leone. What's really interesting about this is there's something that's really odd. I haven't been able to really clock it what it is. I watched a video and they showed um, a, a tombstone that had a Freemason sign on it. We have a Maroon berry. Right here, this is a girl that Charles Ross. He was a And then when I clicked on the free, uh, Freemason on Wikipedia, I came up with, um, you know, uh, Elmus Aramis, who was the first Canadian um, Freemason. And then I saw Jamaican Freemasonry and they was talking about that as well. And so I found it quite odd and I was like, hey, there might be something in this. Um, bear in mind the fact that they were so used to um, using spiritual powers when it came to fighting. There may have been more conversations that were had between the British and the um, Maroon clans around their spirituality. Um, but yeah, I mean, safe to say this was a, a great example of the fact that we will not sit down and let ourselves be taken. We will not surrender, but we will fight our position when we need to. So Queen Nanny has been placed into the Hall of Fame in Jamaica. She's been chosen as a heroine and the only heroine so far um, when it comes to um, uh, Jamaica's history. So if you're a big fan of history, or maybe you're not a big fan of history, I hope you've enjoyed this rendition of conversation we spoke about. I hope that you will go and research some more. Watch out for our second episode where we talk about Cujo, the leader of the Leewood, um, you know, Maroon clan, and discuss a little bit more about the history around the slave revolt. Hey, do me a favor, make sure you like, share, subscribe, click on the bell button for notification of the uploads. We appreciate you staying locked and loaded. And make sure you remember, Maroon, Maroon, Maroon. Nanny of the Maru, Cuba, where she ran away. Nanny of the Maru, Cuba, where she ran away. Nanny of